morning, uh, respected chairpersons and friends. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about the surgical correction of genu valgum in the immature skeleton and its effects on gait. Genu valgum is a double-edged sword. There is a cosmetic deformity and there is a functional deformity. We all know that persistence beyond the age of eight years is considered pathological and there are long-term consequences. And a lot of us surgeons base the surgery based upon radiographic features so that we can avoid potential osteoarthritis. So there is no real proof that it really causes osteoarthritis in the long run. But there are certain articles which tell us that the mean peak pressure in valgus knees is significantly increased in the lateral condyle. And this may have implications on joint cartilage. And there is some controversy as regards genu valgum and osteoarthritis because there is no proof of development of osteoarthritis in genu valgum in long term. However, some studies like SPECT CT have shown an increased tracer uptake and higher risk of bone marrow lesion. Histological studies in animals have revealed severe cartilage changes and it is said that genu valgum may aggravate and deteriorate pre-existing osteoarthritis in adults. Uh, growth modulation is a process, procedure, intervention or action designed to change, alter, modify or guide the growth and development of the axial or appendicular skeletal in whole or part and is based on the principle of guided growth where cessation or deceleration across a growing point or a group of points is done to balance correct or overcorrect deformities. Around the knee, we use something called as guided growth using the eight plate or its modifications, which are this. You can also use the blount staple or something called as a screw and a monofilament, or even butterfly plates, which have now come out. It can be temporary or permanent, like a transficial screw or a facial ablation. Now let's look at a case. This is an 11-year-old male patient with a nutritional rickets, persistent frontal plane Angular deformity, there is no sagittal plane deformity in this case. There is definitely a mechanical axis deviation. If you calculate the mechanical malalignment, the problem seems to be in the distal femur. But many a times when these children are about a year or two uh, uh, before skeletal maturity, we tend to do a distal femoral and a proximal tibial medial hemiapophyseal disc to gain maximum amount of advantage. The implant placement, as we know, is extraperiosteal, equifacial, and equicortical in the lateral view. And uh, this is your implant set. So essentially, you start with marking the physis. Once you do that, you do the same on the lateral view as well in the mid sagittal plane of the distal femur. Once it is done, you go up till the periosteum by a deep dissection, expose the extraperiosteal layer, do a facial marking in the AP and the lateral, confirm that your plate is in the center center. Once you do that, you place your plate, check it on the C-arm, and then put your wires. Once you're sure that your wires are in the metaphysis and epiphysis, you can drill. Here, the important point is you drill about one third of the hemiepiphysis and hemimetaphysis. And when you put a screw, the screw should be at least half of the hemiepiphysis and hemimetaphysis to gain a good hold. Once you insert your screws, that is your final result. And that is where it was done in the tibia. This was the preoperative radiographic correction. This is the post-operative. The axis has realigned and this is the pre-op and the post-op x-ray. Now if you see the changes in gait pattern, this is an 11-year-old girl who underwent guided growth at the age of 7 years and you look at the pre-op gait, you will find a lot of changes which have happened over a period of correction. You can see that the foot progression angle is positive. You can see that there is a knee varus. There is a shift of the center of the knee medially, there is a varus thrust, there is a proximal femoral adduction, and there is also some sort of a circumduction where this child is trying to clear uh, the two limbs when she walks. Now this is essentially observational gait analysis, but the changes in gait after correction of genu valgum have been studied in an article by Stevens in JPO 2004, where they analyzed analysis uh, after genu valgum correction using the blount staple. And when they compared the pre- and post-operative gait analysis, what they found was there was a complete restoration of normal kinematics. There was a resolution of the circumduction gait. Resolution of the foot progression angle in some cases where there was no rotational malalignments pre-existing. Normalization of the hip adduction angle. Normalization of the distal femoral varus movement. And centralization of the medially shifted knee joint center. There is another article which actually studies gate uh, the, the effects of genu valgum on the ground reaction forces and subtalar joint function during gate. Uh, this article basically says that genu valgum significantly influences the center of pressure 
displacement and the vertical and the mediolateral magnitudes of the ground reaction forces. The center of pressure was shifted towards the lateral side of the foot by 12 to 14 millimeters during heel loading and by 7 to 9 millimeters during propulsion in this particular paper which had about 18 patients with genu valgum. Genu valgum also causes the mediolateral GFR vector to become more medially directed which would tend to decrease the uh, subtalar joint pronation movement or increase the subtalar joint supination movement. So to summarize, genu valgum, unlike what people believe, is more than a cosmetic deformity. It affects the kinematics of gait. The changes in static mechanical axis tend to get exacerbated during the gait cycle. Correction of genu valgum leads to restoration of mechanical axis and it may have long term implications as regards joint degeneration if it is not corrected. Thank you very much for the attention.